DHH just launched a new Linux distro and the tech community is losing its mind. But the chances are, most of you are still putting up with the crap Microsoft is pushing down our throats. Or, if you are fancy like I am, you are still putting up with the crap Apple is pushing down our throats while charging you $2000 for a basic laptop. So it looks like the time has finally come to join the cool kids using Linux. We are still too inexperienced to choose an actual distro and that in itself is an endless, pointless debate. So in this video we'll look at the basics. Here are 5 basic skills you need to survive in the realm of totally not toxic Linux users. It's often said that everything in Linux works through plain text files, so it probably makes the most sense to start by understanding the Linux file system. At its core, a file system is like a master index or data table that keeps track of where every piece of data lives on your storage device. Each file, ranging from photos to text documents or system configuration files, exists as scattered blocks of data on the disk. On top of that, a particular file can reside somewhere in the disk memory that's a great distance away from another, nearly identical file, created minutes or seconds apart, and all the parts of a single file might not be contiguous. The file's actual location on the disk won't necessarily remain static over time. So if you want your data to be reliably retrievable, you need to abstract all these variables away and rely on some kind of index that can consistently point you to the resources you're after. So the file system's job is to map those scattered blocks into something that looks organized like a hierarchy of folders and files that make sense to us humans. In Linux, all the files in a disk partition are kept in directories beneath the root directory, which is represented by the forward slash character. These directories are following the Unix file system hierarchy standard, so you're going to see pretty much the same basic layout whether you're using a Linux distribution, Unix, or even macOS. Etc. is where all your configuration files live. If something needs to be set up or tweaked, it'll probably end up here. In variable, the system dumps things that constantly change from logs to caches or temporary emails. If your system ever runs out of space, this is one of the first places you should usually check. Of course, home is where your personal stuff lives and bin contains the operating system essential programs. lib contains shared libraries and the behind-the-scenes code that bin programs rely on to actually run. In other words, they are the dependencies of your operating system. Finally, USR is kind of weird because the name makes you think it's for users, but it's actually for user-installed software and their resources. Navigating the file system is what you'll do most of the time, and the good news is there are only a handful of commands that you'll end up using constantly. List will show you the contents of the current directory. You can add flags like dash "-l", for a detailed view, or dash "-a", to include hidden files which start with a dot. To move around the file system, you can use change directory, and if you get lost, you can use the print working directory command. To look inside a file, you can use cat, which dumps its contents straight into the terminal and, in longer files, less lets you scroll through one page at a time. Finally, for moving things around, you can copy, move, rename and delete files and folders. Once you're comfortable moving around the file system, the next thing you'll need to learn is how to actually install things. Unlike Windows, where you download a shady installer and then end up with malware in your system, Linux software comes from repositories and you use something called a package manager to access them. This is kind of an app store, but without the bloat, ads and subscription traps. But before looking at more Linux features, let me tell you a few words about today's sponsor. Ever feel like you're flying blind when your app slows down? You check the logs, scan the dashboards and still can't tell if it's the database, the network or the code. That's where MongoDB Atlas turns on the lights. With built-in observability and new interoperability features, Atlas helps you see exactly what's happening and why across your entire data layer. You can analyze slow queries in real time, that is to say, sub-second updates, monitor performance trends over extended duration, and stream metrics to tools like Datadog or Splunk for a unified full-stack view. Less finger-pointing and blame games, more root cause identification, and problem-solving. Check out the description to see how modern teams get clarity with MongoDB Atlas observability. Back to the video, it's important to know that Linux distributions come with different package managers. The good news is they all follow the same basic logic. You add things into the system with the install command, you remove it with the remove command, and you make sure everything is up to date with the update and upgrade commands. And if you don't remember the exact name of a package, you can always search for it. Now you'll eventually come across universal package formats like Snap, Flatpak and AppImage. Each of these is trying to solve the same problem of making software work across all distros without dependency hell. Flatpak isolates applications in sandboxes and works on pretty much every major distro. 
Snap integrates well with Ubuntu, but tends to be slower. And AppImage is just one executable file you can download and run instantly with no installation required. The good news is that once you are familiar with the file system and understand package management, Linux stops feeling intimidating and you start realizing that everything ranging from installing your browser to rebuilding your entire desktop environment can be done faster with a few simple commands than by clicking through endless setup wizards. Congratulations, you just unlocked level 1 of Linux Mastery. This is a big achievement and you are currently here. Knowing some of the basics is not really enough, and the kernel is where we start digging deeper into how Linux actually works. If the file system is the map of your house, the kernel is your parents who actually move stuff around, keeps the lights on, and makes sure nobody's trying to burn the place down. Considering the state of the dev job market these days, I assume we are all back living with our parents, so I figure this is a pretty good analogy. The kernel is written in the C programming language and is the core component of the operating system that talks directly to your hardware and exposes all that to higher level programs in a safe, consistent way. For instance, a browser doesn't talk directly with the CPU or the GPU. Instead, it sends system calls to the kernel, which then decides how to execute them safely and efficiently. And the same applies for any kind of operation, ranging from moving files on the disk to Wi-Fi management. The kernel is mainly in charge of process management, memory management, device management, and system calls. I know that these sound abstract, but they're what keep everything running. Process management decides what runs when. Every app you open is a process, and the kernel is constantly juggling them to make sure the system doesn't freeze. It also isolates processes from one another, so if one crashes, it doesn't drag down the entire system. Memory management decides who gets what RAM and when. Without it, every app would just grab memory and never let go, which, to be fair, is basically how Chrome behaves even with a kernel. Device management is how your system handles hardware through something called drivers. Instead of installing random executable files from shady websites, Linux uses kernel modules, which are chunks of code that can be dynamically loaded or unloaded as needed. The Linux kernel is monolithic, which means it handles all these things inside one large program running in privileged mode. This design gives it high performance and flexibility, though it also means bugs at the kernel level can crash the entire system, but this is actually pretty rare. What's more interesting is that the kernel is also modular, so it can be customized and rebuilt. Every distribution, and trust me, there are too many already, ships with their own kernel configuration optimized for different purposes, but they all share the same open source core, developed in collaboration under Torvalds' supervision since 1991. Now that you know what the kernel does, it's time to look at how you actually talk to it. The shell is your command line interpreter, and it's what scares most people away. I'd argue the black terminal screen is almost as dreaded as the Windows blue screen of death. The shell takes the commands you type and turns them into actions the kernel can understand. When you open the terminal and run a command to list the contents of a directory, you're not talking directly to Linux itself. You're talking to a shell, and the shell talks to the kernel for you. There are many different shells, and this is where Linux starts to feel even more like a cult. The most common one is the Born Again shell, or Bash, which you'll find on most distributions. Others include Z-Shell, Fish, and a dozen more that all basically do the same thing, but with slightly different syntax, completion, and themes. The reality is that picking a Linux distro and shell is just like picking a JavaScript framework. It's the same level of pointless gatekeeping, but with geekier people. Once you learn to use it effectively, the shell becomes faster and more efficient than any GUI. You can chain commands together with pipes, redirect output into files, automate repetitive tasks with scripts, and even schedule things with cron jobs. It's also important to mention that Linux is a multi-user system, so every process runs under a specific user account, even if you are the only one using the computer. Each user has a set of permissions defining what exactly it can read, write, or execute, and every file and directory has three permission sets. One for the owner, one for the group, and one for everyone else. You can see this with the list command, and then change them with the change mode command. Whenever you are running any commands, you will probably run them in the user space, also known as the third ring. Linux's permission system is built around a security model called protection rings, which are built like concentric circles of privileges. The kernel lives at the center in ring 0 and has unrestricted access to hardware and memory. While most of the time your code will execute in the third ring, you can also use the sudo command to ask the kernel to execute commands with elevated privileges, often as the root user who has broader access to the system. But remember that Linux enforces strict boundaries between these layers so that even if a user program crashes or gets compromised, it can't directly interfere with the kernel or other protected parts of the system. 
Once you are familiar with the shell and all its caveats, you'll run into the next big thing you really need to know. The user space, or user land, is everything that lives on top of the kernel. It's where your apps, services, and desktop environment exist, and this is basically the part of Linux you actually interact with day to day. Every time you open a browser, text editor, or music player, you're operating in user space. This is also where distributions start to differ dramatically. While the kernel underneath is basically the same, the collection of software, services, and desktop environments defines what kind of experience you get. That's why switching from Ubuntu to Arch doesn't make Linux inherently faster, it just changes how much pain you're willing to tolerate for a minor performance gain. This is also a good time to discuss desktop environments and the visual layer that sits on top of everything we discussed. Of course, there are multiple window managers and toolkits built around the same core Linux stack. But the important thing to understand is that the desktop environment doesn't define Linux itself since it's just another layer you can swap out, modify, or remove entirely. After all, you can also run Linux with no graphical interface at all and rely solely on just the terminal. Congratulations, you just unlocked level 2 of Linux Mastery. This is an even bigger achievement and you are currently here. Let me know in the comments if you want more Linux content on the channel. Don't forget to click on all the buttons and until next time, thank you for watching.